where are you going to put all these? And I heard you have many more of those medals before. Did, not these ones. Did you? Not these ones. Not, these, these, ones. not these ones. They're the best? Definitely. Okay, yes. good. Um, you had a lecture yesterday in Beaux-Arts. Yes. And uh, the title of your lecture was Finding the Sibyl, a tool of the studio. So the Sibyl must be the muse, the inspiration, the, the passion for art. And the studio is, is just your studio? Yes. I mean, don't worry. I'm not going to do the one-hour lecture now. That's why I explained piece. half of the title yes, already yes. myself. Yeah. But the piece was made before the pandemic, but it relates to the pandemic in that it has to do how can we know our fate? And all those questions which one asks, will I survive, will I get COVID, will I recover if I've got COVID, all those deep anxieties as the reason why people need uh, prophetesses, why they need to try to we know we can't know the future, but there's a wish to move towards a future. Okay. So nothing to do with the studio where you're working? Well, the, the, the point at which thinking happens is where an idea, the question of fate or future, meets a technique, a material in which you can think, whether that material is the movement of a dancer or charcoal on paper, but it's using that artistic technique to find ideas you didn't know you knew. Things that are inside you which you can, which you don't pull out, which the technique and the process makes evident to you. So do you remember when you knew? You don't remember when you knew, but when you see something that you can't say what is it in that movement that is right, but you feel it in your taste buds, in your armpits, there's a sweat, there's a heating up of excitement, of something moving towards meaning. And that usually means it's a recognition of something that's been at the edges, in the periphery of your knowledge or your memory all along. It's like saying your drawings were made, but you didn't make them. No, it's not. It's nearly that, but it's not quite that. You are making them, but what happens is this ongoing conversation between the mark you've made and what it suggests to you. Your moment when you're there as the artist and the moment you step back and receive it. And anything that we look at is always a mixture of what comes towards us, an image, a photograph, the world, and what we project onto that image as it arrives. So you see a drawing of a horse, but at the same time, your brain throws out all the other associations of hoarseness that could be there. And this is something that's very obvious in the studio, but not always so obvious in the rest of our daily life. Did the public yesterday have to pay a lot? Because we got your explanation for got free. Got the explanation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that the value of the short explanation is probably the same as its price. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Love that. Brussels is a city that you know very well. You're spending a lot of time here. I have spent a lot of time. It's, it's fantastic to be in this venue. I've always been on that side where you're sitting. Where, where about? Yeah. Well, usually the, the, the director's table's in the middle of the auditorium, mm -hmm. and I'm looking and calling instructions to people sitting where we are, only they're singing so beautifully. So it's uh, always, it's been a fantastic venue to work in, but many other institutions in, uh, in Brussels, with the Kunstenfestival des Arts that Free Lesen ran for many years, in the Kai Theater, in... Uh, the Beaux-Arts with the exhibition. So there's been a strong connection over the years. The collaborators uh, that I work with most closely as designers, Sabine Tunison, Greta Goris, Luc de Witt, uh, all Belgian and Brussels-based, which came out of that first production of the Zauberflöte, the magic flute here in Brussels. So there is a connection, and it's fantastic that it doesn't just feel now a connection to me, but also through the uh, University of the Western Cape as a kind of big support coming along here and being part of it and for that also to take the connection back to South Africa. So it's, for me, it's very, it's very moving. Yeah, I wasn't that aware of this strong connection between those, those institutions. countries. I, I have friends apart. at the different institutions, so I know there has been a connection. 
But it's very moving that there is this joint, it's the first time there's been a joint degree that I've certainly ever yeah. received. And to get it from three institutions, also from, from Ghent, is, uh, the University of Ghent is fantastic. So to all three institutions, an enormous, an enormous thank you. Mr. Kentridge, I don't think you will mind, but you're actually not the first South African getting this honorary doctorate. You know who's the other one? I can, Im I can imagine, but I think it came up on the screen. It, it came, came up, up on, on the, the screen, screen, yes. So I'm very, as you can imagine, one is only delighted to be a colleague of uh, Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Mandela, Dr. Nelson Mandela honoris causa, causa here. Um, which is, I mean, it's, it's an astonishing thing to have grown up in a country both with a, a terrible history, but a country that still had real heroes. And that's rare. And he was a real hero of, not just of mine and not just of all South Africans, but for so many people around the world. And it's true that we all basked in his glory and still bask in the remembrance of what he did. It's an intuition, but it, it feels like making a parallel with uh, the two men we saw just before, Gronowski and Tinel. It's like an uncombinable combination that makes it perfect. Yes, it's an astonishing, it's, it's also remarkable to have seen and to have read and to have heard about my fellow graduands uh, and their extraordinary um, story and friendship and the strength of that. And it is, I mean, even now, even though South Africa is in a very, very difficult situation now and so many of the problems which we hoped would be solved have not been solved and inequality is still enormous in South Africa, it still is looking back a kind of miracle that the transformation was achieved and was achieved with such astonishing generosity, not so much on the part of white South Africans, they got off scot-free, but astonishing generosity and goodwill on behalf of all the people who had suffered underneath the apartheid system for so long. And that's something that I think is insufficiently appreciated by those of us in South Africa who were the privileged and not the victims of apartheid. Forgiving seems to be a strong weapon. Forgiving is uh, something that needs to be spoken about the people who do the forgiving and not those who are forgiven. Mm -hmm. So on this I will be silent and grateful. You're going to make me cry, you know. You uh, think a lot about the harm that power can do to society. I don't know if you can believe, but... Even I in Belgium can relate to that, although I think you get inspired by the political situation of South Africa. It's more than just the political situation in South Africa. Um, for me, a lot has to do with trying to understand the huge shifts that happened in the world and through which we are all still trying to make our way with the gigantic process of colonization of Africa by... Europe in the 19th century, before the 19th century, but primarily in the 19th century, when so many of the ideas of the Enlightenment got turned on their head. And trying to come to terms with the history we're in now, in terms of where we've come from, is an ongoing, it's an ongoing question outside the studio, but it's an ongoing question which feeds the studio and what happens in the studio also. Dr. William Kentridge, um, we, are, we have a tradition, and when I say we, it's the, uh, the, honorary, doctor, the honorary doctor ceremony um, at VUB, is that we would like to ask uh, one of the honorary doctors to represent all the colleagues, and I believe you are the right person to uh, pronounce this acceptance speech in name of all of them. So I invite you to do so. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. It's, it's been an astonishing uh, pleasure and privilege to be present with my fellow graduands, fellow honorary graduands here, and to see the range which we have covered between all of us. And the thank you I want to give to the institutions that have honored us needs to be on behalf of, of all of us. For Mr. Company, whose journey from the Congo to being a mayor in Belgium is an astonishing story. I would say that the, both of us come from countries with extremely difficult pasts. And it is vital for us to understand not only our heroic pasts, but shameful pasts. And to understand how one can come to terms with that. And Mr. Company, I would say on your behalf, a thank you to the people for understanding that we are part of this journey, not that it has been done, but that it continues. I would say also on behalf of the scientists, and a thank you to them I would give personally as a, a, as a husband of someone who has gone through cancer therapy, as the father of a daughter who has had very terrible cancer therapy, my gratitude to the scientists who are working at the edge and changing possible outcomes. I have to think of two members of my family at least that would not be here without the work being done day by day by the scientists and following the most rigorous protocols. So for that, I would say thank you from me. I know I'm meant to be thanking everyone on behalf of you, but work out the mathematics, it will go around. And And for, on behalf of the, the two men who had these completely different stories but have come together and shown the power of friendship, the power of friendship when it both has to do with transcending historical enmities, but the power of friendship in its, in its strongest form as a central way we have to make our way through the world. How do we know we are not alone in the world? One of the vital ways is through the heat and the warmth we get of an ongoing, long-going friendship and the combinations and conversations that have gone on. And all of this brings us back to the question of how on earth we find our place in the universe. When I was at school, I'm sure like most school children, you write in your notebook when you're six or seven, you write uh, grade one, you know, your name, William, grade one, um, King Edward the seventh primary school, Houghton, Johannesburg, South Africa, Africa, Southern Hemisphere, the world, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, going out, out, out. And there's something both reassuring in that going from yourself, who am I, that this entire universe comes out of me, but that also can work the other way that, oh my God, what happens when that whole universe collapses from all that space down on top of you, and what is the weight of that? In the way that you can think going forward, you've got your parents and two grandparents, and uh, two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and again, you have this spreading arc going out. So one's caught in that pressure of X, and one's caught between thinking, if you look at the whole universe, I am nothing, I'm this tiny speck, but if you look from the ground out, you have the feeling, I am everything, everything comes from me outwards. And that's a question which unites uh, people, whether you're a historian, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a cosmologist, and whether you're an artist, trying to say, we know how limited we are, we know how limited our space is, but nonetheless, we have to believe and act and continue as if we're going from us outwards and everything opening up. So I would say a thank you from us for, or to all of you for bringing us together, this group of different graduates at this particular ceremony, and for the honor that you have done to, to all of us, and to say a huge thank you on behalf of all the graduates here today. <laughs>